Hey, John. This is Danny from the University of Rhode Island. Dormify is my go-to for the most trend-forward and unique products for all of my rooms over the years. I love that no matter how my style changes, I can always go to Dormify for inspo to style my space. I cannot recommend it enough for anyone wanting to make their space their own. Thanks so much, John. Thank you, Danny, for sharing your thoughts on Dormify. For those of you listening, be sure to check out our show notes where you could find our Dormify affiliate link and our most updated coupon code where you can save 15% on most Dormify products. As a reminder, our podcast does receive a small commission for purchases made through our affiliate link, but rest assured, we only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit you, our listeners. Thank you and best wishes to all. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today Manuel Carballo, who is the Vice President and Dean of Admissions and Financial Aid, along with Tom Abeda, who's the Director of Admissions at Oberlin College and Conservatory in Ohio. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today. How are you? John, doing great. Thank you so much for having us. We're excited to talk to you today and to to check in and tell you a little bit more about the college admissions process in Oberlin and why we think it's such a great place. I am also excited. I just want to say that, uh, you know, you're getting two for the price of one today, John. (laughs) And so we were so excited to talk about Oberlin that we couldn't just contain it to one. That's fantastic. Well, we're excited to hear about it. And ironically, uh, a listener had reached out to me saying, hey, could you get Ovalin on the podcast? And I reached out to you guys and right away you said yes. And here we are today. So a shout out to that listener. So let's start by me asking you, Manuel, can you provide us an overview of what Ovalin College and Conservatory offers its students in terms of academic opportunities and what sets it apart from other colleges and conservatories? Sure, John. Happy to uh, start out. I would say at the at the onset, in some ways, we're a pretty traditional liberal arts uh, college, right? We're a uh, good balance across the humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, mathematics, uh, with what we typically get with a small liberal arts college. Your small classes, uh, real access to professors, being a part of that small community where folks know who you are. You're not going to sit in the dining hall by yourself. There's going to be a nice sense of community uh, with very strong academic programs. And so at, at the core of it, we're that small liberal arts college. Um, with the the wonderful benefits of having a conservatory as well. But I would say one of the things that that's drew me to Oberlin is this idea of an education for a purpose. I've always worked at small liberal arts colleges where, where there's a little bit more. Uh, we certainly have uh, amazing, strong academic programs for our students, um, but there's also a little bit of that um, extra weight on their shoulders as they're uh, graduating from Oberlin uh, that, that gives them that intention of going out into, into the world and making the world a better place, right? There's a sense that uh, they're lucky to have been here. Um, one of our mottos is think one person can change the world, so do we. And our students really take that to heart, uh, right? The idea that they're going to go out there and uh, take that wonderful education that they get here and go out there and use it to, uh, for good. Tom, you want to talk a little bit about the conservatory as well? Absolutely. And again, that's one of the things that really makes us uh, distinctive is this this fusion of the arts and, and academics in one campus. And so our conservatory, so when you think about a conservatory of music, it, it, it's a certain style. It's, it's its most rigorous music instruction. It's primarily with one mentor, right? So you'll have one faculty member, uh, you know, building a studio, say that if you're a trumpet player or you play piano or violin, but it really is. We're the only conservatory of this caliber that focuses in on undergraduates, right? And so for many other conservatories, you might have many more graduate students than you have undergraduates. And so the attention is truly on like the undergraduate experience and study music at the highest level. But one of the things that really uh, kind of sets us apart, too, is this idea of the big, small college uh, with uh, just under 3,000 students between the college and the conservatory. Right? We offer over 1,500 courses uh, which is many more than our peers. And even physically, we're actually located on a 440-acre campus. Uh, we have four separate libraries. And so there's some great things about being on the bigger end of small. Well, that's fantastic. A small liberal arts college with under 3,000 students, 1,500 programs. I love the idea that you're talking about a small campus with access to the professors. And education for a purpose is your mission and statement, which I really appreciate. So I know that Ovalin is known for both its College of Art and Sciences and its Conservatory of Music, as you gentlemen just explained. 
So Manuel, how does this unique combination enhance the overall educational experience for students in both divisions? Absolutely. Thanks, John. So think about the the idea of, again, a typical liberal arts college, and then uh, put on top of that, that conservatory. So there's a nice synergy, I think, that that inspires that profound connection between the you know artistic expression, theater and practice, and professional discipline that you get from the conservatory with then what it means to explore uh, different academic disciplines uh, uh, that you might get from a, from a college. So um, so we have about tw- uh, just under 3,000 students, as Tom mentioned. About 600 of those students are in the Conservatory of Music. Um, and out of those students in the Conservatory, about a third of them, a third of that 600, uh, are enrolled in what we call the double degree program, where they're both doing uh, instruction in, uh, in music, but also uh, getting a degree in the College of Arts and Sciences. So there's a lot of overlap in what, they, uh, what, what we do. Um, uh, in terms of the design, the students live in the same dorms, eat in the same dining halls, take the same courses, uh, and so they're physically located on the same campus, and it, it just gives the opportunity for students to uh, to really talk to and connect with each other. So your roommate could be a history major, or it could be a heart performance major, uh, and so uh, there's that connection to do a little bit of both. What it practically means for our students is that we have over 500 concerts a year. So if you think Mm. about being on campus and, you know, the academic year, uh, almost two to three concerts uh, every day, Uh, plenty of opportunities, 40 to 50 dance performances uh, and theater uh, opportunities. We put on two full-fledged operas every year on campus. We have musicals going on. So there's just so much creativity uh, in terms of the arts uh, that whether it's something that you want to do as a potential conservatory student at Oberlin, or you just would like to hear a, a jam band on a Friday night at a party, uh, music is going to be all around you. And so uh, there's a lot of opportunities to get a chance to do that. Um, and as I mentioned, about a third of those conservatory students are double degree. So for those students who have that interest of, you know, I want to continue being, uh, you know, a, a piano performance major, but I also would like to study neuroscience, you get a chance to do those things, to do that double degree program. Our double degree program is a five-year program where you have to apply to both the College of Arts and Sciences and the conservatory and get into both. But then it gives you the chance at that highest level to really take advantage of both of those. Um, All the way to those of us who are not particularly musically talented, we get a chance to just go to all these wonderful concerts and really have these students who are really wonderfully bright and creative um, uh, and get to take advantage of those opportunities. But things like practice rooms are available to everybody. Uh, You can just walk in and start playing the piano. Uh, uh, Our college students can continue to take uh, secondary lessons uh, or learn to play a new instrument. Uh, so the possibilities really are endless there. And we just get that uh, wonderful benefit of having the creativity of our conservatory students. Well, I appreciate you talking about the 600 students in the conservatory while emphasizing that one third are in the double degree. Now with a double degree, I just want to make sure I got it right. That's a five-year program. Is that correct, Manuel? That's correct. Well, I appreciate that. And Tom, what else can you share in terms of insights into the student life experience at Oberlin and what kinds of extracurricular activities and organizations are available? Obviously, there's, you know, two concerts a day. But what else could you tell us about student life at Oberlin College? So, uh, you know, we are a full residential campus, right? And so most of our students that are coming, in fact, you're required to live on campus all four years. And so there's a bunch of different living options that exist on our campus. But um, the beauty about being um, kind of a smaller college in a smaller town um, is that students create the culture that's here, right? And so they're the ones that that, that are, uh, if you're interested in a certain topic. And so we do have over 170 uh, student organizations that are active on our campus at any one time. And, and again, and it could span, you know, a bunch of different interests from, oh, we're really into politics or service or um I don't know very very many campuses uh, across the country that have their own circus, right? So we actually have uh, something called our O Circus, which is a student run. Again, it's not a they don't have animals and they're not taming lions and that kind of thing. But it's more like a like a like a Cirque du Soleil troupe where it really does involve music and performance and storytelling and acrobatics and and uh, you know we actually teach a class here at Oberlin that student taught on how to be an aerial artist right and so hmm. there's some neat things when it comes to um, <laughs> just the opportunity that students might have but uh, there's themed living uh, throughout our art communities and so if you if you're interested in a particular like oh I want to live in a language house with it that I only speak French in the French house or or Russian or Spanish or so there's there, there's those types of, of communities 
And so if students choose to want to be clustered based upon interest, they can certainly do that. Uh, and so um, there, there are some fun, fun ones. Uh, I know one of the more popular ones over the years has been our our sci-fi hall, which is where <laughs> students that if they're really interested in sci-fi, hey, they can live uh, uh, together and, and talk about zombie proof in the rooms or whatever, whatever <laughs> comes into play when 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 it's that. But but it truly is um, lots of different activities that, you know, with Oberlin, it, there really is this commitment to like sustainability, um, carbon neutrality. And so even when we talk about living communities, there's our eco Olympics that happen every year that that that. That, that students are competing with each other in terms of you know their their use of water and 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 energy and and so and that's actually uh, led throughout the entire city of Oberlin too, um, but we are a community that that does have uh, varsity sports right so we are Division three athletics and so we have twenty one varsity sports we we do have a, you know football team basketball lacrosse soccer swimming and diving and so. Uh, but along with that, there is this commitment to health and wellness too. So if you wanted to take advantage of a rock climbing wall or take a yoga class or mindful meditation, right, it's all about that balance between mind, body, and spirit. And I think our, our students are definitely taking advantage of that. But um, a couple things that are unique just about us, which is I think it speaks to the community itself, is something called our art rental. Hmm. Right? And so we have one of the best undergraduate or college-wide art museums in the country. And so, uh, in fact, if it, it, we have so much art in our art museum and on its current rotation, it'd take over 30 years to cycle wow. through all the art. But we do something <laughs> called art rental where a current student could actually rent a piece of art from our art museum and house it in their dorm room for the entire semester. Oh, wow. Right? So that's um, unique. <laughs> and again, and literally like when students had to start lining up uh, and be in a physical line, students would camp out overnight in the courtyard just to be first in line because we actually have some masterpieces on loan. I, I've known tour guides in our office that have had original Picasso, Oh, uh, we wow. have had Degas, Matisse, <laughs> Andy Warhol, and so no insurance company will cover us, right, because of the great <laughs> liability. But uh, it, it is incredible that that kind of the access. And so, you know, I know there's a lot of universities and colleges where where people will, will line up, you know, and 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 wait for hours in line to get football tickets or basketball tickets. But at Oberlin, right, students will camp out overnight to get access to a masterpiece <laughs> work of art and put it in That's the dorm. That's amazing. <laughs> and we rent out about 500 works of art a semester. So it, it's significant. And, it, and it's, it's just one of those neat traditions that make Oberlin Oberlin. Well, that's definitely a neat tradition. And I love what you said at the beginning. You said the students create the culture. You also mentioned that they are required to live on campus for four years. And the fact that you have about 170 organizations from sci-fi clubs to a circus and of course the great athletics that you have and it really sounds like there's something for everyone i also read gentlemen that your retention rate is just over 90 percent, which is astonishing it's a tribute to the great work that you do in admissions to get the right people on your campus but also the great sense of community that you foster to keep the students happy and wanting to come back year after year and i think a big part of it is that the fact that everyone lives on campus, you really build that community. And again, as you said, the students create that great culture that we have at Oberlin. So I'm going to go back to you, Manuel. Can you tell us what is Oberlin, Ohio like and how do students engage with the local community? Sure, thanks. Uh, it, it was fun for me to move to, to Oberlin. I've been here for about eight years now. Um, and and it's a nice balance of both having a small town. There's uh, just under 9,000 permanent residents here in the town of Oberlin. So it feels like a very much a, a small town, uh, but there's a cute downtown. There's It's kind of that quintessential college town. Um, have young kids. It's safe for them to ride their bikes around, uh, you know, walk uh, from the bus stop uh, home, um, which is nice. But what I really like is that m many of the faculty and staff members who, who work at the college uh, just live in town. And so I live four blocks from where I am right now in the office, um, which means that I get to uh, not just see students when I come into work, but I get to see them just walking across the street, right? Uh, as I'm outside playing soccer with my kiddo. Um, <laughs> uh, they get to be, uh, you know, our babysitters or cats sit when we're away. And so <laughs> just being able to f uh, form those relationships with our students outside of that formal setting uh, is part of what I like about that kind of smaller community that you get. Um, being, again, just a couple of blocks from campus means that um, it's fun for me to go out to the basketball game on a weekend or on a Wednesday night, right? And my kiddo's the one high-fiving the players as they're going on, on and mm -hmm. off the, the court. Uh, and so 
I, I think that that's fun for me. Um, but we have that while we are also just um, a short drive from Cleveland too. Uh, and so it, it's nice to have that balance of having a, um, a major city. Uh, Cleveland has the second largest theater arts district in the country. Uh, wonderful music, uh, wonderful art, uh, but also uh, world-class healthcare. So there's a lot of great things going on in Cleveland that our students have access to if they would like to. Um, while accessing things also like a, um, uh, the airport, which is only about 30 minutes from where we are. So I would say it's a, it's a nice balance of, uh, of, again, that small community with access to a big city. It is true. In terms of taking advantage of, uh, of the city of Cleveland, right? I've literally been from the parking lot in a baseball game <laughs> to my home in literally 45 minutes, right? Wow. So again, I wasn't exactly driving the speed limit, but, <laughs> but it does talk about that. And, and I know that this idea of a small town and maybe we do get many students that come to Oberlin that are coming from large metropolitan areas. So this idea of coming to a smaller community, uh, I, I think it is everything that you have about that. And, I, and even in some of our literature, we used to say that we're the most metropolitan small town you'll ever be in right? because we do get a lot of students and they are creating that culture. But you have that here in Oberlin, but if you wanted to have access to Cleveland, which we do have regular uh, shuttle service between the college and the and and certain parts of Cleveland uh, every week, and so that is an opportunity that that students can take advantage of. Well, we appreciate that you're talking about a safe small town with about nine thousand people, and of course, you emphasize the short drive to Cleveland and. If students don't have a car, they can take a shuttle, which is fantastic. So students, if you want a small town feel with that rich sense of community, but you want to be close to a metropolitan area, this might be the perfect setup for you. So Manuel, I'm going to come back to you. I was curious, what is Oberlin's approach to the admissions process? And could you elaborate on the criteria and factors considered when reviewing applications for the College of Arts and Sciences? Sure. Happy to chat a little bit about that. Um, we know that sometimes the admissions process uh, generates a lot of anxiety for students, right? What is it exactly that we're looking for? And part of it is because so many of us practice what we call holistic admissions, um, which can sometimes feel like a little bit of a of a mystery or a black box where we don't exactly know what's going on. From our point of view, we actually love what that means, right? It means that there isn't just a a dry set of criteria where a GPA, a score, and a class rank go into some kind of machine and and, and just tells <laughs> us who who's coming out. Uh, the process for us really is about um, uh, getting to know the students. Uh, we're trying to build a community. We want to get to know a little bit about who's coming into our community. Um, being a college, the most important thing is going to be the academic experience, right? And so we get a, uh, a taste of uh, what the students have been able to take advantage of during their time in high school. So the first thing we'll look at is what classes have you taken? What opportunities have been available to you? And have you taken advantage of those opportunities, right? And so it's uh, uh, the rigor of your course load. Are you taking the tough classes? Um, we would love to see, uh, as most in selective admissions do, that you're taking the five core courses all four years of high school. Right, that you're taking a math, a science, a foreign language, a social studies, English, uh, but that you're that you're challenging yourself, right? And um, and yet we're small enough that you know if math is not for you, that that that's okay. But we would hope that you would then double up on one of the other ones, right? Um, to to kind of suit your skills. But we're looking for that academic uh, strength for sure. But then beyond that, we're really looking to build a community. We want to make sure that you're going to be a, a great roommate, uh, that you might bring your artistic or athletic talents to the institution, uh, that we that we can figure out a way, that we can picture you on campus while you're here. The other thing that uh, as we talk about kind of building a class every year that, that I like to say is that we're also um, committing to these students, not just as students for four years, but uh, these are our future alumni, right? They're going to be part of the Oberlin community for years to come. And so we want to make sure that these are folks that we uh, we want to have around us for for, for many many years. Uh, we love it when our students come back. We love it that um, you know that we get to read about them in the papers. Uh, and so um, so again, it's, it's it is the academic experience, but it goes beyond that. It's what else are they providing for us as we do this? Um, one thing that I will add that that I think uh, is important for us to say is um, as we're reading. Um, 
uh, we are what we call a need aware admissions process, uh, which means that as we're reading, um, we do look to see whether students have applied for financial aid or not. Um, uh, a few years ago, back in the 90s, um, we, we made a real commitment to be uh, to do what we call as meeting 100% of the true demonstrated need. We wanted to make sure that every student that we admitted, we could certainly support uh, and give all the resources and opportunities available for when they came in. But it meant that uh, that we had to be um, a little bit more selective. And so uh, it's something we can certainly talk about a little bit more. But, um, but that need aware is as opposed to what you might otherwise hear of need blind, where admissions officers might read um, students without regard to, to their uh, financial need. Um, the the great part about it is that we really are able to support all those students that we admit. Uh, we provide um, generous uh, need-based financial aid for our students, but we also realize that for some families, merit aid is important as well. And so we have both need-based and merit-based financial aid. Every year we provide over $90 million in financial aid to our students. Um, and uh, and we're, we're, we're happy to be able to do that. So I would say admissions is both about selecting that wonderful class, but then about making sure that uh, students then are able to afford the opportunity opportunities uh, if they choose to come to Oberlin. I want to welcome back Sean Patel, who's the CEO and founder of Prep Expert. Sean, thank you so much for being here. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me, John. Just wanted to do a quick shout out for an amazing deal that we have for college admissions process podcast listeners. We're offering 30% off all prep expert SAT and ACT courses in tutoring. It's live online. We've got the best score improvement guarantees in the industry. You'll get taught by 99th percentile instructors. And you can save 30% off when you go to the show notes of the College Admissions Process Podcast. Grab your discount code for 30% off and click the link in the show notes. Thank you, Sean. So great to have you again. And to everyone out there, please note that if you make a purchase through any of our affiliate links, the podcast gets a commission. But rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. Thank you all and best wishes. Well, we really appreciate that overview, the holistic admissions approach. You talk first about the academic side but also that side where you're building community. So on the academic side, you're looking that the students take the five core courses for all four years, which of course is math, science, social studies, English, and world language. In terms of your building community, you wanna see the types of things that the student did while in high school so that you could see the type of person they're gonna be on your campus, what kind of roommate, what kind of classmate. I love how you made reference to what kind of alum they're going to be. That's unique and something new, and I really appreciate that. Now, I know you touched upon the need-aware basis of your review process. Manuel, could you just elaborate a little bit more exactly what does need-aware mean? Because there's so much terminology in the world of uh, admissions, and just to make it clear to the students and their parents, what exactly does that mean when a college is need-aware? Sure. Um, so... We know college is expensive, right? And so I think um, we, we want to make sure that, that again, we provide all the resources available for those students that we come in. Um, unfortunately, what that might mean is that as we're reading applications, we would look to see uh, whether a student has applied for financial aid or not and how much aid uh, they might need. And that might make a difference in terms of our applications. Uh, and so we will be more selective for students uh, requiring more financial aid. And we might, um, uh, because of, of the limited um financial aid that we might have for our students. Um, but the nice thing is that there, there is no um, disqualifying number, right? It's not that if you need a full ride from us to be able to attend, that you would not be able to get in. You would simply be mm -hmm. in a little bit of a more selective pool. Uh, but we, if we took you, we would then be able to still fund you fully uh, because we meet that full demonstrated need. Uh, and then on the other end, if you were to not qualify for any need-based financial aid because you were lucky enough that you would be able to pay our full uh, tuition, room, and board, um, there are also opportunities for merit-based financial aid uh, to make sure that it would still be something that would be uh, affordable for families. Um, but I would say, um, you know, plenty of schools might say that they are need blind, but then not meet full need, right? I would say that kind of mm -hmm. that gold standard in admissions is both that you get to be um, uh, to meet full demonstrated need, but be need blind, right? And that's a, a couple dozen schools that might be able to uh, to say that they can do both. Um, for us, we're we're unfortunately not at the place where we can be truly need blind, but we're thrilled to be kind of at that next level where we we will certainly fully fund the students who. Um, 
who we were able to admit. That's great. And then, as you said earlier, you also have merit-based scholarship as well, correct? That's right. Fantastic. And going back to you, Tom, if you don't mind, how does the application process differ for those students who are applying to the Conservatory of Music? So one of the things that makes us unique, again, is this when I talked about it earlier about this idea of the fusion of the arts and academics at Oberlin. And so when we think about the Conservatory of Music, now it is its own kind of separate division. They have a separate admissions office. Uh, in fact, um, it's a pre-professional program, right? So students mm-hmm. that are going to the conservatory are thinking, hey, I, I want to be a professional musician, a vocalist, a composer. And so it really is all about the audition, right? So the audition is is, is key, right? So it really is talent-based. Um, I also like in kind of the recruitment process for the conservatory, really similar to kind of like competitive D1 athletics is that... Hmm. When coaches, when, say if you're a football coach and you're building a team, might you want a quarterback, you want a, some running backs, you want wide receivers. In the same way, right, an orchestra, you need to fill a certain number of strings. You, you know, you oh, I need French horn, I, I need a, a harpist, a percussion. And so those are things that are critical. And so the way that it works is that faculty will work together to kind of build up who they would want in their studio, right? Unlike if you're... If you're a biology major in in the college, right? You you're going to take many different professors, and you're going to have all these different classes. But if you're an instrumentalist in the conservatory, right? You're going to have one primary instructor in that studio, and you're, it's going to be like a mentorship relationship. And so, so what faculty members are doing is that they are kind of cultivating their studios. And so, oftentimes, it's you know, it's what is very pivotal is that students will come. They'll come and visit the campus. They'll have a lesson with a professor. And so then not only do students are looking for, is this going to be the right faculty member for me? But faculty are also saying, is this a student that I want to spend the next four years with? Right. Uh, and so <laughs> it really is personalized, which is really great. Um, one thing that's different, like I said earlier, too, that between a, a, a bunch of other different conservatories, our primary focus is undergraduates. And so it's audition-based. And once students audition, right, they do have to submit an application. They, mm-hmm. uh, they, they do have to pass a pre-screening. And so if they, once they pass the pre-screening, then they'll be invited to audition. And most of those happen on campus. Um, but if uh, students are unavailable to do that, they could send in recordings. Um, and then after the audition, that's how faculty will make their decisions. Well, we appreciate that. So the audition, if you get to that point, students, it is in person. If there are some circumstances that prevent that, it could be, I guess, video-based or virtually. I was wondering, though, Tom, any advice for students coming to the audition? Is there something that students do that's a definite, oh, boy, this person is not coming in? In other words, what can they do if they're lucky enough to get to that point where they could audition? Any words of wisdom, advice, things to do, not to do? What do you think, Tom? Any student that is conservatory level, uh, like mm-hmm. uh, qualified, that kind of style, that rigorous music study, uh, it, it really is about there's a certain number of pieces uh, that students need to prepare. And so, yes, it's about, you know, but, <laughs> but these students have been doing it for, for a, a, a big part of their lives. And so I think it's just a natural progression. But that idea of kind of making sure they're focused, relaxed. But I, but I think that, that that's kind of the nature of some of these uh, and kind of pre-professional programs, especially performance, is that it, it, there is a bit of competition there, right? And so you kind mm-hmm. of start to weigh out, like, who, who else is here that's that's auditioning for, <laughs> um, for my piece? But it really is about just making sure that students put in the time, they prepare their pieces, and then during that time, it really is kind of that 20 minutes of audition can make a really big difference. Well, we appreciate that, Emmanuel. Can you provide information about the percentage of students that apply from out of state? And does the application process differ based on in-state or out-of-state status? Sure. Happy to talk about that, John. So um, we really bring in students from all over the country and all over the world. So we have, um, you know, we enroll students from 50 states, over 50 different countries. Uh, We, interestingly enough, only enroll about 6% of our students from the state of Ohio. So we have about twice as many international students as we might uh, students from Ohio in any given class. And so uh, we'd love to see more Ohio students, um, you know, and and we certainly uh, try to do that. Um, But uh, it's wonderful that we um, were able to bring in students from all over. California and New York are two of our most represented states every year. Uh, They're the top two. Um, 
uh, it's the same process for everybody, regardless of where you're coming from. Uh, we take the Common App, uh, the QuestBridge app, the Coalition application. Uh, and so uh, it's the same process, no difference uh, as a private school, whether you're in state or out of state in terms of uh, how that process uh, works. Um, no application fee. No application mm-hmm. fee at all for any of our Very students. Um, uh, I would say in the College of Arts and Sciences, there is one in the conservatory um, um, for that process. But uh, but it means that um, you know that we really get the privilege of reading uh, applications from all over. It's wonderful to get every year wonderful students from Oberlin High School, uh, mm-hmm. and also to get students who are coming from around the world. Um, uh, and so it's a it's a nice balance. And and so much of then of the learning experience happens because our students really have. Um, uh, those very different um, experiences having grown up. Uh, and so our kids from afar can go home with their, uh, you know, friends from close by for Thanksgiving and the like, uh, and you'll have classes with students who are really truly learning from each other um, because of their uh, their different experiences. Well, that's terrific. And back to you, Tom. I know we touched upon financial aid, but how else do financial aid and scholarship opportunities work for prospective students? And are there differences between the college and the conservatory? Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, we, we are committed to meeting 100% of demonstrated need of any student that, that enrolls at Oberlin, right? And so when my mom said need aware, right, what does that mean? And, and how are we dealing with it? Um, you know, so again, it, it could be more competitive for a student, uh, but we're not going to gap. If, if we end up admitting a student, then we're committed to making sure that they, uh, that Oberlin is going to be affordable for them, right? And so, um, and so we're looking at that. We, we do use the CSS profile as well as the updated FAFSA, right? So we're looking at those things. And with that, we're determining a family's uh, kind of their demonstrated need. And then we'll meet 100% of that, you know, with most of it being grant money, right? And then there are some loans and then work study. Um, and and, and that's, how, that's how we'll end up kind of meeting that financial aid package. In terms of the differing between both, uh, you know, the conservatory and the college, it's, it's in regard to our, because we do offer merit scholarships. And so on the side for the college, what we're looking at is students' academic performance in the context of, of kind of what they've been uh, exposed to or access to. And so so we are looking at a, a student's overall academic performance demonstrated through the rigor of their curriculum, uh, you know, their grades, uh, if they have standardized tests, yes, but we're also test optional, right? So, that, so we're not going to hold it against a student if they don't do that. But we look at like, class rankings. We're looking at all those things to kind of get an assessment of, of how well did this student perform. And so we do have something called our 10K commitment, our, our uh, scholarship, which is we feel confident enough in the students that are applying and are admitted to Oberlin that we feel that that they're going to get at least a $10,000 scholarship, right? Wow. And so, And that's both to the college and the conservatory. And then in addition to that, right, we'll still, students may qualify for more. And so we have up to about half tuition scholarship um, to the college. And then for the conservatory, now it's going to be based upon talent, right? So those students Hmm. that auditioned for the conservatory, their merit or their talent scholarship will be based upon their audition. So depending on their skill level and how great they they either they sing or play an instrument or, 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 or how great of a composer a student is, they can also earn talent scholarships, and they range right. They'll, they're they're guaranteed at least a ten thousand dollar commitment scholarship, but they could qualify for a scholarship upwards of full tuition, right? Wow. And so, um, <laughs> and then all of our scholarships are all renewable for you know eight semesters. Um, but if you're a double degree, it shouldn't take five years. It can be up to ten semesters worth. Of, of, so it's not like some schools might offer a merit scholarship only for the first year, and then afterward it, uh, that or. And so, again, all it is, we just want students to be full-time students and be in good academic standing to maintain the scholarship. So, so again, I think that we're certainly committed to making Oberlin an affordable place. And so with that, you know, meeting 100% of need, but then also for families to realize we do offer merit and talent scholarships, especially for those families that maybe don't qualify for need-based aid, but Oberlin could still be a great option. Well, you're definitely dedicated to making it affordable. Thank you so much for that overview. And I always put the Office of Undergraduate Admissions in the show notes. If there's anything else that you want me to put in the show notes about your financial aid, scholarship, merit-based awards, just provide it to me. And of course, we'll put the links in the show notes. So Manuel, speaking of academics and speaking of all these great students that come to your school, can you share the average profile of the current freshman class 
including GPA and any other relevant information. I know that you test optional, but if you have the info on SAT or ACT scores, that would be great. And what advice would you have if a student falls lower than that mid-range? Sure. Happy to chat about this. I think there's a lot a lot in that question in terms of uh, what's there. I would harken back a little bit to what we were talking about with um, – holistic review, that we're really looking at putting the student in context. And I think one of the things that uh, I just want to caution, uh, you know, students as they're listening to this is that they're not saying, oh, no, I don't meet those standards. Forget it. I'm out. There's no opportunity. Right. Um, so much more goes into it, right? We want to see, again, the, their leadership, what they've done, who we think they're going to be on campus. All those things are going to be really important as we're doing it. Uh, but I did mention, right, academics is the most important. So we want to see that students have done well. So typically that means more A's and B's, right? Uh Fewer and fewer schools are ranking, but most of the students, you know, if you're coming to us from a school that's rank, uh, ranking students, most students come from the top 10, 20 percent of their classes. Um, again, it's an, uh, more A's and B's. So our average profile for admitted students is about a 3.7 uh, GPA. I like to say that that means nothing because at some school, if you don't have a 4.0, you might be outside of the top half and at others, right. you might be the valedictorian. <laughs> and so, again, it's harder for us to tell. And that's why I think something like rank that at least says, you know, we're looking for you to be closer to the top of the class and closer to the bottom. We want you to do well. But the context is so important because you might say, but I had a 4.0. Well, but that was weighted with a 6.0 at the top. So I would say hmm. don't get too uh, caught into the the stats just because uh, we really take the time to get to see where you're coming from and you get to know where you're coming from. Um, on the scores, I would say uh, we are test optional. Uh, and when we say test optional, we mean it. Please don't stress out about it. Uh, if you feel that your scores represent you well, feel free to send them in. If you don't, then uh, there's absolutely no need to send them in, and we are not going to second guess you by any means. Um, our average ACT for students coming in is about a 31. Uh, it's just under a 1400 uh, for the SAT. Uh, but again, we look at that in context of what are those averages at your high school? Uh, and so those same scores at one high school might look wonderful and at a different high school might not look uh, as uh, as exciting. And so we will look at both uh, as we do that. But I would say, again, the context is going to be the most important thing. And um, and don't let one thing um, you know preclude you from applying. We're looking for that fit, uh, right, and who we think is going to be wonderful. Uh, and there's things that Tom mentioned, right? If you were an amazing musician and applying to the conservatory, uh, your talent might weigh a little bit more than the, the grades. Uh, on the College of Arts and Sciences, certainly your grades are the most important, but we would be looking at, again, fit and other things as well. Well, we appreciate that. And I was curious, just as a follow-up, the GPA – do you calculate it yourself or do you use the one indicated on the transcript? We calculate it ourselves, um, yeah. again, to give it uh, more of a, a little bit more of a, um, uh, an equal view across schools. Right. And so we would, going back to those five core courses, we would typically look at, uh, you know, counting just those for the four years that you're there. Um, and so it's an unweighted GPA that we would look at as we're, as we're looking at things. But again, we look at you within the context of, uh, of your high school. Well, I appreciate that. Tom, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to say a little bit about, I know, man, well, when he said that if you're looking at the conservatory and it, and it is talent-based, but I did want to throw in the note that for one third of all the students that are double degree, one of the most common majors for a double degree student is actually a natural science with music performance. Mm. In fact, some of our best students in the college <laughs> are also in the conservatory, right? So you might have someone that is totally into physics, that also right. plays the piccolo, right? Or hmm. someone that is, you know plays the violin, but is just you know crazy for neuroscience, right? And so that idea of that kind of well-rounded, that balanced kind of, uh, and again, it's that theme of like kind of that fusion of the arts and academics, right? There are some just incredible students that want to continue pursuing both at that high level, and so, uh, so yes, we're looking at those things. But it just made me think of a. Uh, uh, there are students that also are, are, are super talented in both areas, and, and they don't want to give that up. And I think that's where that niche of the double degree fits in. I love that. And again, it seems like you have something for everyone. And I also want to point out again, and it's a theme that's come up a lot in the episodes, that mid-50% in terms of the SAT and the ACT, those numbers are skewed, right? Because you're test optional. And so the only students that are submitting are those students that you know have done very well. And so those numbers today are very different than they were, let's say, five years ago. So I just wanted to point that out. And Manuel, going back to you, what are some of the different things that students do to demonstrate their interest 
And does this factor at any time in your overall application review process? Sure, that's a great question. So um, this term demonstrated interest, right? So how much have you shown us that you love us uh, is, <laughs> is something that comes up a lot. And, uh, you know, w- when we get to be selective, right, when we, we are only choosing a certain number of students, I would certainly say that there's always this, this um, you know, we like to be liked, right? And so we like it hmm. when somebody's told us you're interested uh, in, in us. Um, I would, you know, even though some schools say they don't do demonstrated interest, I always argue that if you have an early decision round, uh, that you're always looking at demonstrated interest, right? Because you are asking students to raise their hand if this is where they want, you know, their one hmm. top choice. And so um, I would certainly say we look at it, right? And there's ways to demonstrate that. Demonstrate that. So visiting is probably one of the uh, the, the highest uh, forms of demonstrated interest that we have out there. But we have so many international students or kids from far away that might not get a chance to, to come here. Other things in terms of demonstrated interest can be certainly things like jumping on our mailing list. Um, are you opening up our emails? Um, when, uh, if you get a chance to request an interview, when you interview uh, with one of our alums or one of our students uh, or staff members, um, are you asking us where Oberlin is located and how many students do we have? Hmm. Or have you actually been reading those emails and you already know all those things and you're asking us about uh, specific courses in the neuroscience program and uh, how Oberlin has the oldest neuroscience undergraduate program in the country, right? Hmm. Uh, that's where you're showing that you really care about us, that you know us, um, uh, and uh, and how excited you are. I actually... so. Yes, it's there. It's not the one, you know, if you visited five times versus one, that doesn't mean you have five, you know, uh, you're five times more likely to get admitted than if you're not. <laughs> you don't do that. I do sometimes talk about what I call demonstrated disinterest. And and, mm. and I would just say, be careful with that, right? Um, if you show up to the Oberlin campus wearing a, I'm not going to say another school, you know, uh, <laughs> but uh, another college's uh, t-shirt, right? Uh, you should show up to your interview chewing gum. Uh, if we mm. visited your high school um, and you didn't come see us, um, you start kind of telling us that maybe you're not as excited or if you scheduled an alumni interview, but just didn't show up. And so I would just say, be mindful of those things. I think certainly take advantage of every opportunity uh, to let the school know that, uh, that you're interested in them. Uh, the biggest form of demonstrated interest for us is those wonderful students who apply to us early decision, uh, sure. who have really done their homework, who have found that this is a great fit. And if we can bring in students who are here because this is where they've decided that they really want to be, we're really excited about that. But I would say, you know, um, we're bringing in uh, about a third uh, of our class through early decision. And so most are coming through the regular admissions process. So uh, if you fall in love with us, that's wonderful. But don't feel like you you have to make that early decision if you, if you don't get a chance to visit or if you uh, are still having, you know, second thoughts or have other wonderful schools that you're considering as well. Uh, I think there's an opportunity to do that as well. Well, I appreciate you uh, mentioning the best form of demonstrating your interest is applying early decision, right? Because that's a binding agreement. Now, Manuel, obviously, many students, they'll apply early decision, and they get that letter telling them that they might be deferred. And right away, they think, oh, my God, I'm never going to get in. I'm done, which we know is not necessarily the truth. What it means is it's a no for now, or we're not ready to make a final decision yet, so we're going to put you in the regular pool. What else would you say to a student that might get deferred in the process? Sure. I would say there might be a couple categories. Uh, In some cases, we are looking for more, and more Mm -hmm. usually means grades, right? Uh, Say you had an amazing freshman, sophomore years, but your grades dipped a little bit in junior year. Um, Rather than just seeing that first quarter of grades senior year, we might want to see a whole first semester. And so we might want to see that continued, you know, that you bounce back up uh, and that you're, uh, again, on the right track. Um, and it, it otherwise might be exactly what you said, John, that we we're looking to compare you with everybody else. I would mm-hmm. say um, one of the most uh, missed opportunities is, uh, you know, all defer letters typically say, write us and let us know, give us more information. Uh, when you get that letter on December 15th, don't feel like you have to respond by the 16th. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. not a whole lot has changed in the month since you've applied. Um, but certainly in the next month or two months, let us know if there's something new. Uh, Oberlin, for instance, does not have a, a Why Oberlin essay, right? But this is your chance to write that Why Oberlin essay, right? Uh, I'm so sorry that I didn't get admitted, but I'm still very excited about you. 
this is why I think you're a particularly good fit for, um, you know, uh, I'm a, for me and why I think I would be a wonderful student. And this is what I've been doing uh, in the meantime. And so uh, I, we look at those. Uh, the number of times that we look at the first students where nothing has changed, they haven't updated anything. Um, it's unusual that we would make a different decision if, if there's nothing that's been added to the file. So I would say definitely take advantage of that opportunity. Um, we will deny students if we don't think that they have a chance. And so, as you said, it's not a no, it's a no, no for now. Uh, and so we definitely want to still see what, um, uh, you know, what options the students might have for later, but please do take advantage of that opportunity. I would just add, you know, similar to deferral, some of those same things would apply to wait list, right? If you did mm -hmm. end up getting on the wait list and, and how do I kind of reaffirm my, my, my interest in the school? I think some of that same advice that Manuel offered would also work in the wait list uh, uh, realm. Well, I appreciate that. And I also appreciate that you talked about if a student is deferred or like you mentioned, Tom, waitlisted. It's very important if you're going to reach out to reach out with something new. You know, I love how you talk, Manuel, that there's not a Y Oberlin essay, but it might be a good time to write one if you're in one of those categories being deferred or waitlisted. And I want to go back to demonstrating interest, which is a common theme. But I always like to remind students that demonstrating your interest and doing things like you said, visiting campus opening emails, but also engaging with any links in the emails and really learning everything that you can about Oberlin in this case, it gives you an opportunity to demonstrate your understanding, students. Perhaps you want to go to a conservatory where you could do a double degree, such as at Oberlin. That's something that you could talk about, why you want to do that, how you see yourself there, how you see yourself contributing. And that just might be the difference between getting you off the wait list or getting you from deferred to admitted. Any thoughts, Manuel or Tom, on that? I think that's exactly it. Uh, again, we're trying to get to know you and uh, and having that opportunity. It, it, you're trying to find where you think you're going to be happy for the four years. So uh, I like the way you turned it around, John. It's not just about um, being able to, to 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 say to me why you think it's a great choice. It's it's what's going to help you, right? It's getting on our mail list, mailing list. It's what's going to help you decide whether we're a great fit or not, uh, right? We're so excited when you when we talk to you and you have done that. And and you're right, it, it, sometimes it's in an essay, sometimes it's when you visit your, visit your high school. Uh, if you come to us and you know exactly who we are and you've already done your homework and you've done your research, um, we might make a mental note or write it down and say, you know, this is great. I really hope that the student applies. Um, uh, and that's part of that process, right? We, we really get excited when, when we get a chance to do that. Um, uh, but take advantage of the opportunities. I think one of the great things that we learned from the pandemic is that we could do a lot of this virtually. And so mm -hmm. if we don't get to your high school, we get to almost a thousand high schools every year, but we don't get to all of them. Um, but you can always, every day we have, um, every week we have virtual information sessions, tours, opportunities to meet with students. And so there's great opportunities to really engage with us um, and get a chance to to get to know us a little bit better so that it makes your process a little bit easier. Well, we appreciate that. And Tom, back to you. When reviewing applications from various high schools, how does Oberlin consider differences in available resources such as advanced placement courses, and how does this affect the overall application review process? So we've mentioned this a couple different times already, but this idea of the holistic review means that we're reading an application in context. Mm -hmm. right? And so first of all, we do have a, a full team of 14 of us in our office that all do travel. And so what we try to do is we have individual uh, admissions counselors recruit from a, a specific area and we, we, we want to have some consistency there, right? And so for myself, I been in Oberlin for 22 years. I've always wow. read the Southwest, right? So I'm, yeah. a, I'm originally from New Mexico. So any hmm. kid that applies from New Mexico, I'm going to read their application, right? And so hmm. it's similar, like, so if a, someone's doing New Jersey or they're doing LA, we're familiar with the schools, with the curriculums. And, and then this idea of, of uh, every high school also has school profiles, right? So they provide uh, information about the school to say, here's what our curriculum is like. Here's here's any changes that we've made. Here's here's how uh, uh, how to read our transcripts, right? And so we're looking at all those things. So right, we're not going to hold it like uh, against a student if we think, gosh, this student only took two APs, but if only two APs were offered, right? It, it'd be different if if a school offers fifty APs and the student has taken mm. none, right? And so when we're reviewing an application, right, in context means we're going to look at what's available to the student and how that student took advantage of, of what they, what they could have done. And because right. we've often see school uh, students that 
maybe not very much was offered at their school. So they're, they're even going outside of their school to take classes at a, at a local college or a community college or, or taking advantage of some summer programs. But I also know that's, that could be limiting in terms of just finances for certain families. So, so again, we're looking at all that in context, and that's what really helps us make that best determination of how well did a student do with the resources that were available to them. And certainly if, they're, if a student has access and they're taking APs, or if they're in an IB curriculum, you know, we like to see students that have, have taken curriculums and coursework that is, that they're challenging themselves, right? Uh, but we also still want them to be successful, right? And so it's not a matter of, okay, every student, you need to be taking 15 <laughs> APs because we've also seen that where maybe people have taken too many and, right. and it really has impacted their performance. Right. And Tom, are there specific support services or accommodations available for students who might have had an IEP while in high school to help them, of course, ensure that they continue to be successful once they're on your campus? So the short answer to that, John, is yes. <laughs> right? So, so every, every college, every, every, every university, we want to make sure that we have um, support services or support network in place to make sure a student's going to be successful, right? It, it, it serves no one if we admit a student and they're not going to be successful, right? That, that, that's, right. Not, that's not the case. We want to make sure that they have uh, the support necessary. And so uh, our, our network includes a, a bunch of different offices across campus, but just to name a few, it's, it's first of all, they're going to have an academic advisor. Uh, they're going to have a, a peer advising leader, right? Particularly during that first uh, month and that first year. And so they're going to have upper class students that are going to be there specifically to kind of and, and a peer advising leader, P-A-L, right? they'll, they'll have a pal that will help them <laughs> to register for their courses, take advantage of resources. And then through our Center for Student Success, uh, students could actually have a success coach. And so helping them with transitional stressors or time management, goal setting, study skills. And so and we certainly you know, have work with students too, if they need accommodations, if they need extended time, or if they needed some help with test taking and so forth, um, you know, uh, or note taking, you know, those are all available. And those are standard services for, for, particularly for small, you know, private institutions that they're going to make sure that students have the, have those. And, and these aren't any additional cost, right? That's just part hmm. of, of the resources that we have available for students. This has been a phenomenal and comprehensive conversation. Before I get to the last question, is there a question that I didn't ask or a topic that I didn't bring up that you'd like to share with us now, Manuel? I think we had a great conversation. I'm not sure there was anything we did. We, you know, we touched upon a lot of things. I would say, you know, a couple of things that, that maybe we didn't get uh, as deep into. About tw- uh, just under 20% of our incoming students are recruited athletes. Um, mm. uh, I feel like they play a very important part in our campus, both in terms of the wonderful opportunities that we all have uh, to go and cheer them on, uh, the great opportunities for um, leadership that it gives our students, uh, and, and certainly uh, the school spirit that they bring to our community. Um, I love uh, the fact that Oberlin has that wonderful reputation for music uh, and what our conservatory does for us. but. Um, just that reminder to folks out there that we are kind of also a very traditional liberal arts college that, uh, you know, 600 of our students are in the conservatory of music, but we have uh, another 2,300 or so who are here is at a, at a pretty typical liberal arts school with all the wonderful things that, that, um, uh, that comes with it. And so um, I would say those are a couple of things that I would just mention, not necessarily that we didn't touch upon, but that uh, that I certainly want to highlight about the the Oberlin experience. We like to kind of brag or, or, or say that we were the last <laughs> Ohio school to beat Ohio State in football. Um, <laughs> it happened a little bit ago uh, when, you know, we're no longer a D1 school, of course, or we weren't before then. But uh, <laughs> but there is there is a proud tradition, I think, of, of, of wonderful athletics here at Oberlin as well. Um, and, um, you know, we like that as well. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. And Tom, same question. Is there a question that I didn't ask or something that I didn't bring up that you'd like to leave with us now? So a couple things. First of all, even just for the conservatory, we've talked about that as a conservatory and the rigorous and it's it's pre-professional. But in fact, almost half of all the students that enroll in our college have been like uh, seriously involved in, in, in the arts and performance. And so students choose to come to Oberlin because Yes, they, they can study history or English or biology, and then yet they can still take advantage, you know, like, like access to courses. They could actually minor 
in in the in the hmm. music conservatory and still be just in the college. And so they're on the same thing for anyone just going into the in, into the conservatory. They could also minor in something in the college, right? So you don't have to do the full double degree. If we look at like level of rigor, that's like the most rigorous combination is this full double degree where you get two full majors, one in the college, one in the, in the conservatory. But there's there's everything in between between that and then maybe hey I just you know want to be a single major in the college but I'm going to just go to a performance now and then. Hmm. But this idea of academics at Oberlin, um, maybe we, we kind of glossed over it, but it is rigorous, right? But it's not like super competitive among students. Like I'm like our students are hmm. bright. Like literally two thirds of our students will go on to graduate schools within right. five years after they study. Right. And then nearly one in five of our graduates eventually earn a PhD. So if you hmm. look at the last hundred years, we're the number one producer of PhD candidates <laughs> in the country, right? So, and that's including the sciences, right? And so when people think, oh, yes, Oberlin's great in, in the humanities and the arts, and we are, but we, you know, students go on to medical schools, law schools. And so there's some really neat things about being that like rigorous academic setting, but still having the freedom to kind of really explore other interests, right? And so that. That's what I think of when I think of like uh, the quintessential like uh, liberal arts experience. It's it's a well rounded kind of balanced uh, experience, and so uh, it really is that neat thing. When I and I've said it many times, is this fusion of the arts and academics that really does I, I think make us distinctive. Well, that's absolutely beautiful, and I'm glad that I asked the question. And unfortunately, it does lead us to the last question. I'm going to start with you, Manuel. What is your top piece of advice that you would give students and their parents who are getting ready for the college admissions process, particularly those interested in Oberlin? Sure. Um, a few thoughts. I think one is it kind of have fun, uh, right? Hmm. Um, uh, we know that this can be a daunting process, but this is also where you get to choose where you're going to be for the next four years. You can make friends of a lifetime. You get to go off and be on your own, study the things you want to study, uh, really kind of engage with with cool people. And so try to have fun through the process, right? Uh, you're going to make it. Uh, there's plenty of wonderful options out there for you. We hope Oberlin's one of them. Um, and uh, you can get there kicking and screaming, or you can get there really kind of having a, a lot of fun and enjoying it. And, and we see both. Uh, we hope you'll be the one who chooses to smile as you walk in the door uh, and, and do that. So I think have fun, but also be yourself, right? Uh, I think a lot of the questions we get in the admissions process is, what do you all want to hear? What are you looking for? Um, and the answer is, we're looking to get to know you. Uh, and so it's it's less about, you know, don't give me what you think I want. Give me who you are. Uh, it, be your authentic self. That's who we're really looking for uh, as we're going through that process. It makes it easier for us to get to know you if you are um, uh, taking the lead in the process. Uh, I think oftentimes uh, it's family members who are doing that. And so, you know, the, the number of times that we have a student be the one who walks in the door and goes up to the front desk and says, mm. I'm here for the information session. I'm here for my interview. <laughs> it tends to be mom or dad, right? And so it's, it's, uh, it, it's so much nicer when it's a student, when it's a student asking the questions, uh, when it's a student kind of taking initiative. Um, everybody has a role in the process. Uh, it's okay for uh, everybody to, to certainly uh, be a part of it uh, and certainly bring everybody along, students. But, uh, but we love it when you are the one that's taking that initiative. I think that's something that, um, um, that really stands out, again, because unfortunately it happens um, uh, on really rare occasions. Well, I appreciate that, and I love what you said. Don't give me what you think I want. Give me who you are. So that's <laughs> great advice from Manuel to the students. Tom, same questions. Your last piece of advice for the students and their parents getting ready for the process, particularly those interested in Oberlin. So when we think about uh, financial discussions, I think that uh, most students probably don't have never had a real conversation about finances with their parents. And so this is the time to really kind of begin that dialogue and certainly take advantage of the financial aid tools. There are estimators uh, on, on our website, as well as every college's website that you can kind of look through to kind of see how much is it going to cost uh, us as a family and just to have kind of have those real uh, yeah, conversations. I, uh, the nightmare is that when we've admitted a student and they get their financial aid package and then the parents come back to say, wow, this isn't going to be enough, but I always promised my my son or daughter, my child, hmm. that they can always go to this school wherever they want. Now, right. how do I have that conversation? And I, I just think beginning to be I just have honest dialogue uh, between the students and, and, and parents about the, the financial piece. Um, I think, you know, I, 
Hmm. It is really getting to know institutions, right? I always liken the, the the college search process to ice cream just because I love ice cream and I know everyone likes <laughs> ice cream, right? But but if you can think about uh, the flavor of each college, right? It's the students, right? And so I think at this level, in terms of the type of education that, that these private um, institutions will offer, you're going to get top-notch professors, professors mm. that love to teach, that are just <laughs> oozing when they want to be your mentor, right? And so you're going to get that at a lot of places. But the difference out of each school is going to be kind of the culture, the student, the vibe, and the flavor of each campus. And so I think getting to know the campus through various ways and reading blogs and checking stuff out. But if you can ultimately visit, that really says something. And, and then the last part is just that even hopefully from this conversation, you've got a little bit that there's real people behind the admissions process. Mm. And so, um, <laughs> you know, when we, we talk about building a class and crafting a class, right, we're all reading through different biases, but we're having discussions and we're ultimately, you know, want to do what's best for that student. And we want to bring in a community that we're going to feel proud of. And so we're not perfect, but we are real people and we're reading through that lens. We're not just going through and calculating a number and saying, okay, this gets in and that doesn't, it, it really is a, a labor of love. <laughs> None of us <laughs> would be doing this, right? Not, we're not in this for the big bucks, right? We're in it because, <laughs> you know, and I have something written here right on my office and it, it's just reminded me of why I do what I get to do. And it's like, I get to be a part of helping a kid with their future and I, I get to open doors and I get to help families hopefully find a place that's going to rewrite for them. Well, that's amazing. And there's no job that is better, more job that is more noble. Tom and Manuel, you guys have been phenomenal today. Ovalin is so lucky to have you, as were we, on this podcast episode. I can't thank you enough, and I'm so happy, as I know that this is going to help so many students and their parents as they navigate through the college admissions process. I do hope to have you both again. Thank you both so much. You're awesome. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Thank you, John. Thank you. And to everyone out there, I just want to wish everyone the best of luck, health, and happiness, and good luck with your college search. Take care, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap. Hi, John. This is Cami from the University of Michigan. My favorite thing about Dormify is how supportive they are with all things college. Dormify is truly like a big sister guiding you throughout the entire college journey. From relatable content on social media to tips on how to maximize your space, Dormify has the answer for everything. I highly recommend incoming freshmen, college students to check out Dormify on social media for all things college. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Cami, for sharing your thoughts on Dormify. For those of you listening, be sure to check out our show notes where you could find our Dormify affiliate link and our most updated coupon code where you can save 15% on most Dormify products. As a reminder, our podcast does receive a small commission for purchases made through our affiliate link, but rest assured, we only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit you, our listeners. Thank you and best wishes to all.